back sort of to the somewhat theme of this parak, which is uh, getting um, food out of storage or from, uh, you know, uh, from uh, places in which it's been uh, set aside. So there's obviously a very dominant muksa theme again to this parak. Um, somewhat like the first one. 31, Lamed Aleph. Revim Eitzim Inosadeh, you can bring wood that is from the field, Mina Mechunas. So if you have gather piles of wood in the field, and obviously that you're planning on bringing back to your house um, and using for firewood, then you can do it, because then it's not mukta, it's been piled up, and obviously you're planning on using it for firewood, um, or for some similar type of use. Umina karfaf, and from the yard, a karfaf is not something that's like way out in the field, as we'll see, it's closer to the city, um, it, it's uh, surrounded by a fence, so it's um, so that's what a karfaf is. It's something that's more considered to be like a, a type of a you know not just where you go to harvest your grain, but you know uh, a yard makes it sound like your front yard. I'm trying to think of a good of a good analogy. You know, it's more sort of like yes. A, Didn't we see this in Shabbat? Shabbat? Well, we definitely had karfaf. Karfaf was a big yeah. thing about hukaf lidira, not yeah. hukaf lidira. So it's some type of fenced in area that is more you know regularly used and therefore more accessible. So if you're bringing from the karfaf, afilu mina mefuzar. Even if the uh, even if the sticks are scattered and not in a pile, the fact that they're in this karfaf, you know, clearly means that they are things that you would expect to be using and therefore are not considered muktza. Ezu karfaf. What is considered a karfaf? Kosha samuch liir. Give a review to anything near the city. So it sounds like that's the only difference. Near the city as opposed to far away. How near is not exactly clear. That's what review says. Rebiosi on there. No, there's another distinguishing factor of a karfaf. <laughs> Anything that you go into with like a key, like a lock and a key, it's fenced in, and um, then that makes it considered, you know, obviously the more something is fenced in, the more it's sort of like, you know, you know, your home, and I mean, maybe that's a little bit taken to an extreme, but something more under your control and in your this immediate sense of use, and therefore, if it has that aspect that it's fenced in and it's locked, a feel Shabbat, even in inside the Tchum Shabbat. Now, it doesn't mean e the way what it means is even at the edge of the Tchum of Shabbat. The Tchum of Shabbat is relevant for Yantiv as well. I had, even if it's at the very end of 2000 Amot, so it's not close to the city, it's as far away as possible as you could get to it on Yantav. Nevertheless, if it is a karfaf that is fenced in, then the stuff in there is not considered muktza. The stuff in there is considered presumably that it is, you know, you would you would assume that you would want to have ready access to it and use to it, and therefore it is not muktza. So the whole debate here is when is are the sticks muktza or not, based on are they scattered or piled up, and where are they located in a field or in this <coughs> karfaf, and what's important about the karfaf, the proximity or the fact that it's fenced in. Now, it's very important to note one question, one issue that Tosus raises, which is, I don't get why the only issue here is muktza. If you have sticks that are scattered, and you're gathering them up in a pile, isn't that a malacha? That's right. So let's Torah. take a look at Torah. <laughs> right, exactly. According to some, that is one of the few malachas in the Torah of Makosha Shetzim. If that's what the, uh, if, you know, that's certainly a reasonable explanation of what the Makosha Shetzim was. Exactly, and it's Eitzim. Yeah. So let's take a look at those. So, so that's a question. It might be the person who gathered up sticks. Oh, so, mina karfa fafil mina mufuzar. Tainus is toastos. Um, ha ha ve ma'amir. This is, this is making, you know, putting stuff in a pile. You know, food, gathering food in a pile. Um, do av malacha, which is an av, it's a doraisa. The yesh lo mer delo shayich imur el remakam shegedei limsham. Kinemuch perach klagado. Imur is the fruit fall off of a tree, or you harvest your wheat, and it's lying in the field after it's been cut, and then you're going to gather it up into bundles. Right so there. Emor is part of the process of taking stuff from where it grows and, you know, and bringing it in and processing it. So the apples fell off the tree, or the wheat was harvested, and now you're going to pull it all into a pile. Okay, if, for example, I spill my... Uh, pasta on the kitchen floor and I pull, pull, pick it all up, that's not Emor, okay? Emor is the raw food where it fell and gathering it. So the sticks, but you would say, oh, well, that might be as the case of the sticks, the sticks in the car fuck. But apparently not. Apparently, maybe in the field, scattered sticks, if they fell off of a tree, could be Emor. But in the car fuck, which is more like, you know, I'm thinking of a car fuck, it's more sort of like a baseball field, right? It's not like a field out there where you have your wheat and you're growing stuff. It's a yard, like it's, you know, it's a, 
it's it's your a backyard. park, but a, not necessarily your backyard. A lot. lot. Something. Yeah, yeah, that's the word I was looking for. It's like a lot. So if there's sta scattered sticks there, it is not because they just fell off the tree, and this is part of harvesting the sticks. Okay, but um, so but that's important to know that Tosus is acknowledging there could be a Duraisa problem based on the scenario. Well, I think if you yes. vocalize Carpaf. Carpaf. Okay, you could very well be correct. That's all. Okay. Stencils. All right. My my, my mistake. Let's take a look at the Gemara. I'm a Rabbi Yudam so he says, as opposed to the Mishnah that says that if it's in the Karpev, it could be even scattered, he says, um, the Mishnah says one of two criteria, either gathered up or in the Karpev, a filu scattered. He says, Rabbi Ramesh, well, that you need both criteria to make it uh, considered a uh, muhan, gathered and in the Karpev. So says, We say Karpev is enough, even if they're scattered. Um, so, no, our Mishnah is a Das Yachid that says that that's enough, one criteria, and he's saying that there really is an opposing opinion that says you need both criteria. Titani, we turn to Brisa. I'm Reb Shimon Elezer. Said Reb Shimon Elezer, Lo nechu kubay shamay beitil al hamufuzarim sheba sadot, she'en mifu. Everybody agrees that it has neither criteria, it's scattered and it's out in the fields, that you cannot bring it, that that's mokutza. And as Tosos pointed out, heck, it might even be a Doraiso gathering. Mm -hmm. And also, nobody disagrees about things that have both criteria. It's gathered in a pile and it's in the Karpaf. That that's not looks and you could bring it. What was the debate? It has only one of the criteria. Either it is scattered and it's in the Karpaf. Or it's in the it's gathered, but it's in the field. So if you have one of the two criteria, karpef or gathered, is 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 one enough to make it not mukta? Shabikshami I mean lo yavi, you can't bring them. It's mukta I mean yavi, you can bring them. So what so what did the Gemara prove by this? It proved that according to Rabshim ben Elezer, according to Beit Hillel, one is enough, which is our Mishnah, either either gathered or in the Karpaf. But because it didn't, the, the Brayta did not just say, here's a debate of Beit Shammai Beit Hillel. It says, Rabbi Shimon ben Elezer believes this is the debate of Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. So what does everybody else believe? So Rabbi Yehuda Mashmul is saying, that's Rabbi Shimon Elezer. He's lenient. He thinks it's a debate of Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, and Beit Hillel says one criteria is enough. But, but Rabbi Yehuda Mashmul is claiming that the opposing position says, that Beit Hillel Beit Shammai did not debate this case, and everybody agrees that one criteria is not enough, and that the only thing that is good is when you have both criteria. Okay, so that's the issue. Our mission says one criteria is enough, which we're saying is Rabbi Shimon Lezer's position of Beit Hillel, and Rabbi Yudha Mishmul says you need both. It both has to be gathered and in the Karpaf. So now the Gemara continues. Amar Rava, Ali Kanim Bali Gifani, if you're talking about like, Leaves of um, of uh, of uh, reeds or or grape leaves. Even if they're gathered up, and they're sort of sitting in a pile. Since if the wind were to blow, they would scatter. It's like they're scattered. E is and it's forbidden. Like a pile of leaves. Let's say you raked your yard and you have a pile of leaves. Okay, and you wanted to use those leaves for your fuel for firewood on Yantif. Does that qualify as mechunasi? So Rava says, whether you need one criteria or two criteria, we have to determine if that qualifies as mechunasi. So Rava says it doesn't. Since it's very easy for the wind to blow and for it to scatter, we will say that the fact that they're in a pile is not enough to say that your DAS was on it, you know, it was on your radar screen that you, they would be available to you to use. You didn't assume they'd be available because it would be so easy for the wind to scatter it. But if from the day before you put some like uh, you know vessel on it, you put some like you know tarp on it or something to keep it, you know to keep it stable for even if there were to be a wind, a big rock or something like that, then shop your dummy. Then that's fine. Then that shows that they you know you have taken um, um, actions to ensure that it will remain a pile, and therefore it's considered to be something that's on your radar screen, something that you could expect to have available to you to use. Okay, so right now we've said two things. Is one criteria enough or do you need both? The Mishnah says one criteria is enough, either gathered or in a karpaf. Rav Yudha Mishmul says no, you need both. That's opinion, the, the Mishnah's das yachid, both gathered and in a karpaf. And then the question is what constitutes as gathered? And Rava says certain things that will easily scatter in the wind do not constitute as gathered. Mavadir, yes. Might be gathering? Amir, yes. Okay, so now we say, Ezu Karpev. 
Now, now the question is the debate in the Mishnah between Rav Yud and Rav Yossi. Rav Yud says that Karpev is so close to the city. Rav Yossi said it could be far away from the city as long as it has a lock. So the Gemara is not exactly clear. You know, there are things that aren't being uh, spelled out in terms of, particularly in terms of Rav Yossi's position. So let's take a look. Ibailu, they raise the following question. Hey, what exactly is Rav Yossi saying? Is Rav Yudah saying, what's Rav Yossi responding? Is Rabbi Yudah saying, Kosha Samuch Le'ir, Behud Itle Potachat? Is Rabbi Yudah assuming that a carpet has a fence and a lock, and saying, in addition to a fence and a lock, it also has to be near a city. We're back to the question of how many criteria, but now how many criteria do you need to define something as a carpet? So it needs both close to the city and a lock. That's taken for granted. For us, Rabbi Yossi Lameim, and Rabbi Yossi is saying, no! If it has a lock, there's no, there's no criteria being near the city. It's all about having a fence and a lock. And therefore, Rabbi Yossi is only being lenient. Rabbi Yudah says, yes, it has a fence and a lock, but it needs to be close to the city. And Rabbi Yossi says, I don't need it to be close to the city. That's one way of reading it. Oh, Dioma, or do we say, Hachikamar? Maybe Rabbi Yudah is saying something different. He's saying, Kosha Samach Le'ir, Bein Isle Patachas, Bein Delesle Patachas. It's not a question of one criteria or two, it's a question of which criteria. Rabbi Yudah says, for me, the determining factor is near the city. I don't care if it does have a lock, it doesn't have a lock. If it's near the city, that's a carpet. Okay, so, so, so sometimes I'll be very lenient. If it doesn't have a lock, I don't care, as long as it's close to the city. If it's far away from the city, Having a lock and a defense won't help it. For me, it's all about being near the city. The Asa Reb Yossi Lameim, and Reb Yossi comes along and says, I feel the Betor Tchum Shabbat. Look, it could be at the edge of the Tchum Shabbat. It could be far from the city. But the determining criteria criterion is not close to the city. The determining criterion is a fence and a lock. If it doesn't have the fence and the lock, even near the city. Okay, so it's a very simple question of how do you read the Mishnah. One mentions near the city, the other mentions the lock and far away from the city. So are they saying, one says, the only thing I look at is near the city, and Rabbi Yudah is saying, the only thing I look at is having a fence and a lock. Mm -hmm. Or no, maybe Rabbi Yudah says, I need both. And Rabbi Yossi says, hey, as long as it's got the fence and lock, who needs being next to a city? So how do you read the Mishnah? So the Gemara says, Tashma. I mean, come in here. I mean, Rabbi the Mishnah says, Rabbi Yossi, Omer Kosh, and Ichnasim, Lo, Bepotachat, as long as anything that you go into with a lock, Vafilu, Betoch, Trum, Shabbat, even within the boundaries of Shabbat, even at the edge of the boundaries. Shema Minah, Rabbi Yossi, Tart, Yilu, Kula, Kamar, you see from there that Rabbi Yossi says, you know, either one to be lenient, meaning if it's got a lock, it could be at the edge of the city, and even if it doesn't have a lock, near a city. For him, either criteria enough. And that Reb Yehuda feels that, no, you need both. Now, how did the Gemara prove it from the Mishnah? What in the line that the Gemara quoted showed that it was, you know, that this was the approach. That Reb Yehuda demanded both, and Reb Yossi said either criteria is enough. So that's why you have this huge Rashi, and this huge Tosfos, and they're not one of these interesting Rashi and Tosfos that are coming to figure out how does this reconcile with some other Gemara, or what's the conceptual issue here, but it's like how did the Gemara prove its answer from the language of the Mishnah? It was a very reasonable question. Does Rabbi Yehuda demand two things and Rabbi Yossi only one? Or does Rabbi Yehuda focus on one criteria and Rabbi Yossi focus on a different criteria? How did you resolve it from that language? So I'm not going to tell you their answer. I'm just going to tell you that's what they try to figure out. Okay? It's not so clear how the Gemara resolved it from that language, but the Gemara resolves that Rabbi Yehuda demands both and Rabbi Yossi says, says either criteria is enough. If it's got a lock, it could be far away. If it doesn't have a lock, as long as it's close, that's also okay. So, Shmamina. Amar Rav Sala, Amar Rav Yirmiya, Halachat Rav Yossi Lahaka. And we rule that way, either criteria is enough to define it as a carpe. So on the one hand, defining something as a carpe for lenient, as long as it is either close or has a fence and lock, Whereas what you need in order to allow the, to allow you to use the sticks, there we're going to go like Rabbi Yudah Mashmur, presumably, and demand both things. Both that it be in a carpath and that it be gathered. Fine. All of this is just another example of muktza and a question about when is something considered to be out of my mind and when is it considered to be accessible. I will say the interesting thing in which this is different is that until now, muktza has mostly been things that you're like thinking about, but you have set aside. 
right? Or something brand new, like the egg that's born. But other examples that we've had of muktza are like, you know, the stuff that you've put up on the roof to dry out, or you've uh, put away in storage and you're not planning on going into your to your storehouse, so you've like locked it up. This is muktza because it's the opposite. It hasn't got on your radar screen yet. Scattered sticks out in the field are not sufficiently in your radar screen. Okay, and therefore it has to be something that, so the problem is, is that, you know, and th these are like natural things. It's not like vessels. Vessels are made for human use. They're like automatically seen as things that are supposed to be used by people. Whereas things that are part of the natural world, sticks <coughs> and rocks and stones, that are not on your radar screen, those are like naturally mukta. They have to be made, brought onto your radar screen and something that you could potentially use. So, you know, you would think that gathering them is enough. Personally, I would think that, like the Mishnah, not like Rav Yudam or because once you're gathering them, what's the purpose of gathering if not to use? But again, the assumption would be that even if they're gathered, if they remain out in the field, they're yet to be brought in enough mm -hmm. under sort of human control, you know, to be considered the type of thing that can be considered accessible to you. But here the problem is it starts on the outside and it's bringing it into your scope, as opposed to a lot of other examples of muksa, which are things that are naturally within your scope, food and vessels, you know, and that, but you have somehow done something to push it out, okay? So that is certainly worth noticing the difference here. Yeah, the, the, the term betoch atchum is actually the term used for the, to designate that it's further away. From yeah, that's a little ironic. It is a right. little ironic. Right. means anywhere. Any any out there. As opposed <laughs> to samukhlayir. Right. Samukhlayir, correct. Okay, so now let's look at the next Mishnah. Ein mevakin eats in lomina korot, velomina kora shenishpur of yomitov. You cannot chop wood from beams or from a beam that fell down on Yantav. So the beam that fell down on Yantav, the problem is obvious. You have this beam in your rafters, and it cracked and fell down on Yantav. So first, I hope nobody is hurt and that the house is okay. Yeah. But yeah. now you want to make a fire. So the problem with that is that that is a mukta case. When it, Yanta began, it was part of your rafters. Mm -hmm. and clearly was something that was like out of your das to be using. But how about the beams? What exactly is the problem of chopping wood from beam, just beams that were already available beams before Yantav? So we'll see in the Gemara. And then the next line is, the Ein Mivakim, when you do chop wood, you can't chop it lo bekardom, v'lo bemagera, v'lo bemagal, ele bekupis. Not with a cardone, which is, I don't know, how do they translate cardone? An axe. And a magera is, uh, Rashi describes it as, you ever see those pictures of like the two guys with this like multi, you know, toothed uh, saw, you know, yeah. cutting down a tree? I don't know what word a that was. A cross cut saw. Is that what it's called? A cross cut saw. And a magal is a scythe, which is obviously something that's naturally not used for cutting. But you can use a kupitz, which is like a hatchet. Is that a thing? What do they say for a kupitz? An axe? I thought a kupitz was a cleaver. Cleaver. Which, oh, which a meat cleaver. Like a meat cleaver. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Rashi does say that. Like something used by butchers. Okay, so what is the reason not? So Rashi says, so, you know, <coughs> chopping wood with an axe would seem to be like a natural thing to do. How else do you chop wood? But again, it gets to this uvda de chol thing. You know, if you see people using an axe and using a cross beam, whatever, you know, you think about that's what are people doing when they're going out and at work. You know, you know, if you're if you're 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 out in the fields chopping down trees, chopping wood, and so on. And again, it gets to you know, doing malachas are okay, but it has to have the context of being done at that sort of domestic context and not in the work-based sort of context. So if you're using a meat cleaver and you're just using it to make the wood for the fire, fine. You're sort of like, you know, making the wood more usable in your home. But if you're going out to the backyard with an axe, that already creates a different experiential reality. Okay, so that's not about muktza, that's back to uvdu duchol. But let's take a look at how the Gemara understands the first part of the Mishnah. Okay, so lamed aleph on the base. So the Gemara first understands that when it said you cannot chop wood from korot, from simple beams, what's the problem? They're beams. They're like logs of wood. So it understands that the problem with that in the first part of the Mishnah was the same problem at the bottom. The act of chopping is a problem, meaning somehow it's not a muktza issue, but chopping <laughs> all together is a problem. And the Gemara then doesn't understand. So let's take a look. So the Gemara says, How could you say at the end that you can chop as long as you use a meat cleaver? The beginning says you can't chop wood at all, even from a Pre, you know, even from beams that were around when Yantiv began. So, Amar of Yudam Shmuel, no, no, no. That wasn't the point of the ratio. The ratio was not like shopping issue. The ratio was a mukta issue. It's missing some words, so you have to understand the context, and here's what we're talking about. 
You cannot chop wood from a pile of beams, and specifically what Soar sort of evokes or refers to is like, you know, is like, is like beams that are set aside for construction. So you've got a big pile of like nice pre-cut two-by-fours, and then on Yantiv you decide you're going to use them for your firewood. Well, excuse me, that's muktza. Those are things that are set aside for construction, okay? So that's the problem. Um, uh, where were we? Okay, so mina soa shel korot, the lo mina korot shenish brubi yontov. Those are things that are muktza because they began yontov. They were not going to be used. They were set aside for some other purpose. Avol mevaki mina korot shenish berame erev yontov. But if it's a beam that broke on erev yontov, we would say you know if you have a wood shed where you keep you know your logs of wood for firewood, that that you can chop because that's not muktza. Uchshen mevaki. Now let's talk about the act of chopping. When you get around to chopping it, aim the vacuum below the cardam, below the maga, below the magera, elabakuki. You can only chop it with a cleaver, not with these things which are much more, as Rashi says, kli umnus, like a type of craftsman vessel, and much more of an uvda dechal. Tanya nami hachi, we taught similarly, aim the vacuum eighteen lomina sarasha korot. So it doesn't just say mina korot, which is ambiguous, which could mean logs of wood. The specific use of the word soar refers to a it, like a pile that, as I said, is like a pile of set aside for construction purposes. So that so the bright that makes it clear that that's the context. The lo mina karshenish yomtov, and not from the beam that broke yomtov. Lefi she'eno mina mukhan, and it says explicitly the problem of the first cases is a muktza problem. It is not set aside for use. Now we get to the chopping problem. The lo bikardo, not with a uh, with an axe. Amar of chinena bar shalmaya mishmei derav. Lo shanu ele b'nekei vot shalo, avo b'zachus shalo muta. The problem is only with the feminine part of the axe, but the male part is okay. Now I have to tell you, I understand when you're dealing with, you know, like, uh, um, um, like, uh, you know, what, I, like, um, things that, uh, yes, thank you, but, you know, like, um, um, w w what were the things we dealt with in sukkah, like a, uh, like, a, uh, uh, pipes, you know, yeah. there could be like a, a male part and a female part. You know, by a, by, 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 right, by, a, by, by, by something that is serrated and that's an axe, right? The, you know, if you want to sort of use that imagery, the male part is the part that protrudes and that's doing the cutting. So how are you going to cut something with a female part? So, you know, Ra, I, I didn't really get how Rashi was trying to explain it. I saw, but somehow when it refers to the female part, it's stuff that is not as, like, the, is broader points, not as fine points. And again, it refers to the part that is more used in the context of it being a craftsman, a type of a vessel, and not something that is like just a, uh, for like a home-based cutting. So I really don't understand the, understand the use of these terms, and but somehow nikevot is refers to the part of the knife, and the, again these knives have different sections of them. So the part of the axe or of the knife or whatever that is broader and not so much used, and is not so much like the meat cleaver, and is more used out in the field and for craftsmen and not for home based cutting. So he says that when this hatchet is a problem, it's only a problem using the nikevot shabo, that part which is again more for the Shopping in the field and more for the um, and more for the craftsman type of use of a bezachus the 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 narrower part of it um, that is so that mutah that's permissible because that's more like more like a meat cleaver and that's more like a home based type of a cutting. So the mother says pshita, that's obvious. The yeah. kubitz I, uh, I don't even know what it's talking about, but if you know what it's talking about, maybe it's obvious. The kubitz Our mission says you can use a cleaver, and this part of the hatchet is like a cleaver. So if this part of the hatchet is like a cleaver, what should the problem be? Now, of course, if the problem is uv de it's obvious what the problem should be. It doesn't matter which part you're using. It matters what type of experience it's evoking. So the Gemara says, you think you know what it's talking about? Let's first read the answer, then you can tell me what you're saying. Mao de tayman, no. I might have thought, honey, me the kubitz if it's one thing to use something that's just a cleaver, a valkardum of the kupi, something that's like a combo, a hatchet, that, an axe that also has a part of it that's like a kupi, Ema migo the high gisasser. Since you can't use this half part of the of the of the of the axe, right? He sort of says like it's you know the, the a, there's a wide side and a narrow side, like a front and a back. But if part of if you can't use it with one part of it, so high um, high gisanami also using the other part of it is also forbidden. Kamash Malan, that that's not true, that you can use the part that functions like a cleaver. Now, i got to tell you, my sympathy is to, with the position that it should be forbidden. If the issue here is uvda then 
experientially, somebody's looking at it, you're looking at, you're doing it with this type of an instrument, you know, it, that's the problem of the experience. And that's what the Gemara sort of winds up saying at the end. The Ika the Mas Nila Seva. Some have this discussion at the end of the Mishnah. Not to sort of say not all not all axes are a problem, but to say there are even some cleavers that will be a problem. Okay? Ela Bikupis, you're allowed to use a cleaver. Amar of Chinina Bar Shamaya Mishmed Rav, Lo Shanola Bizach Mishalo. Apparently, a cleaver also had a section that was narrower and wider. And when you can use a cleaver that's only in the male part of it, the narrower part of it, which again is more a different type of a chopping that's done out in the woods, but Aval Bin Nikavus Shalo in the female part of it, Usr. That's forbidden because that's more similar to like an axe type of a cutting. So the more says, Pshita, it's obvious. Yeah, again, I know it's obvious. Anyway, the low bikardum tanan, it says you can't use an axe. So if you can't use an axe, presumably you can't use the axe like part of the cleaver. No. Mao detainment. No, I might have thought Hanimili Cardum. That's something that's totally an axe. Of a kupitz bikardum, something that's a cleaver and an axe. Amo Migo the High Gisa Shari, maybe I should say if you're gonna let me use one part of the cleaver, High Gisa Naman Shari, you should let me use the other part of the cleaver. Kamash Milan, that you don't, that you don't use the part of the cleaver that functions like an axe. So this approach is more machnir, says an axe is out completely, which makes sense if you do the whole concern. And even a cleaver, you can only use it in the cleaver-like function as of it, and not the axe-like function of it. I, yes, I, I have a you have a theory what's going on here. Yes. I think it looks like this. This is a meat cleaver, right? Meat cleaver. I'm not going to, you're a much better drawer than that. This is a meat cleaver, right? Yep. Okay, it's got the, right, it's that smooth. Yep. So this is a thing that's got two sides to it. So you see the female, the male is, this is the you male. think it's serrated and non-serrated. That's correct. So you this think is the you say, you, so you basically think Zohar means serrated and Nikavis means like a, a sharp S single smooth. point non-serrated. Um, well, it certainly is true that the difference between an axe and a home-based knife could very well be, you know, an axe clearly is non-serrated and a home big size is, but, um, so maybe... If they had an implement that looked like that, that would Right, that could be. Yeah, there, okay. The picture that Steinsholz has of a, uh, what he says is a Roman delabra... Okay. ...does yeah. not seem to fit this discussion at all. All right. Anyway, I think we get the idea. Let's go <laughs> now to the next mission. Okay, bias, you see these subyas, other than knowing what they're talking about in terms of reality, uh, are uh, very, uh, are, you know, have been much more uh, straightforward than some of the earlier subyas. Okay, bias, you mali peyrot. You have a house that is filled with uh, fruit. Now, again, a house filled with fruit, you think about my living room, I got it filled with apples, but presumably, you know, basically think about it as you've got a storage facility. You've got a shed, and it's filled with fruit, and fruit could mean apples, but fruit could also mean wheat, okay? Whatever it is. Anyway, you've got your storage shed that's filled with fruit. So this, by the way, no, this, by the way, gets, makes us think about the discussion before about matchilin ba'otzar tchila, right? Can you break into a, uh, you know, to start using, you know, food that's been stored away, or uh, until you've Began using it before you hunted, maybe it's mukta, it's, you know, it's put away mm -hmm. into storage. But let's take a look what the issue here is. Here, the issue is not going to be the use of the fruit itself. Presumably, this doesn't have a status of otsar, or it assumes that you can you begin using an otsar. So the issue is not the fruit itself, the issue is getting to the fruit. Okay? So it was that it was filled with it, but the house was locked, is the idea, before you began, and there was no access to the fruit. The nifchas, and then it sort of a, a, a breached. Something broke in the wall, and now you have access to the fruit. No tomi You can get fruit from, you know, you can go into it from where there's the breach in the wall. Reb Meir Omer, af pote, af poches lechatzil of an hotel. The big chiddish of this mission is Rebbe Meir, who says you can break into the house, break the wall, and get the fruit. Now, Rashi says, why, before we get to Rebbe Meir, which will be the focus of the Gemara, why is it not muktza? If it wasn't accessible, forget the idea of otsar. If it wasn't accessible because it was blocked off in a house, right, why is it that it is, um, why, you know, why is it not muktza? So Rashi says, because the only obstacle to getting at it was breaking the wall, and as we'll see in the Gemara, breaking the wall might have only been a rabbinic issue, and that's not enough to make it muktza. Tosos is not happy with that. Tosos says, who cares? 
cares, besides textual evidence, who cares if it's off limits because of a biblical issue or a rabbinic issue? It was something that was out of your reach. So if it's out of your reach, even if breaking the wall is only rabbinic, it should be muktza. So it says we must assume that our Mishnah is like Rabbi Shimon, who basically doesn't hold a muktza, or who holds of a much smaller category of muktza. Okay, so, but the first part of the Mishnah is it's not muktza. Why not? Rashi comes up with this new idea because it's only a, a rabbinic restriction is the only obstacle, and that's not enough to make it muktza if it becomes accessible. And Tosus just says it's a position that doesn't hold of muktza. But the focus of the Gemara is going to be the last line of are you allowed to break into the house to get to the food? So let's take a look at the Gemara. By the way, this is somewhat similar to the question of destroying packages on Shabbat. Okay, but destroying packages on Shabbat to get to the food is, you know, is an easier issue because uh, destroying a package, it's hard to categorize it, what malacha it is. The issue comes up if I, open, if I open the package in a way that makes it a functional vessel. Like, uh, you know, is opening the bottle cap, does that make it now a functional, clean. you know, clean? Or does opening, like, the old-fashioned uh, milk no. cartons, right, make, make it a it clean? Fun. But to completely destroy it, like to tear open a bag of potato chips, like, basically nobody feels that that's a problem. But when you're dealing with a structure, then destroying it is a problem of so. There. So it's a one way, it's similar to an issue of Shabbat, but on the other way, this particular example, you know, is a much, is a more serious one, and we'll have to see how it gets discussed. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just, I'm bothered by the, you know, we're translating this Mishnah as if it's saying the Niftach, like there was breached, but it's Nifchat. I, I, it must mean the same, but the language I find right. striking, right? right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is true. Or right. it's been diminished in the Diminished, way? right. Like something fell, like like I understand it means that something like fell off of it, and now there's a brief, an there's opening. Less of it. Now well, niftach means like the door is open. Nifchat yeah, yeah. means like the wall fell down. Right, but it's okay. not like a pierce, it's not like a pierce, that's right. Yeah, I don't know exactly. I understand like something like the wall fell down, okay. like a wall collapsed or okay. something. All right, okay. but it's a good point. So let's take a look at the Gemara. So the Gemara wants to understand, how can you uh, break into this? Again, it's not like a bag of potato chips. Am I? Why does Rebbe Mayer let you break into it? Bahaka Sasser Allah, you're destroying a, uh, oh well, you're destroying a structure, you know, an edifice. Oh well, here means less, not so much the roof, but like an edifice. And therefore it's so there because we're right. not, you know, right. that's a malacha. So Amr of Nuchumi Bar Adam or Shmuel, Ba'avira Delivni. We're talking here about, literally means the air of bricks, but what it means is you have stacked bricks, that, but they are not being held together by mortar. And therefore, to take them apart is not really so dear, because there's nothing that is like permanently um, keeping it around, which could explain why it was nifchat also. Maybe it collapsed because it doesn't have any mortar. So therefore, it's not really destroying. Now that's fascinating, because even if there's no mortar, who was it? I remember we were learning when we were discussing this, I think, in Erevin or something. You know, somebody told me about, if, you know, we came up in the Gemara, and, and I think it was Dove Weinstock, or somebody mentioned, you know, how they, they have these, like, stone fences or walls in Europe and in England that were made with absolutely no mortar. Absolutely but it was, it was, it was like, like, there was this real skill of how to fit the stone, and the yeah. stuff has lasted, like, Hundreds and hundreds Colonial of years, America as well. right? So Absolutely. you know, so you can make something that is pretty darn stable without mortar. Now maybe it's different. Stones are irregularly shaped, and if you know how to use them, if you want to use just simple bricks, which are very regularly shaped, and there's no mortar, it's not right. going to be as stable. Right. But nevertheless, you would think at least rabbinically, this has to be some type of so there, even if not biblically. So let's see where the Gemara goes with it. So the Gemara says, "V'hama Rav Nachman doesn't Rav Nachman say." Uh, if there are bricks that are left over from a construction site, okay, so now we're back to the Muxa case. Remember we had before the beams on a construction site? Now we have leftover bricks. The difference are that the beams were not yet used. The bricks are left over. So you have a pile of leftover bricks at a construction site. Shari little Tuluni, you can move them on Shabbos. They're not Muxa. Why? So on the one hand, they're not 
no longer going to be used for construction. So it's not like they're muksa from that perspective. Okay, but what reasonable use do you have for them that would make them not muksa? Howi of the chazi lemizgalayu because you can lie down on them. So therefore, they're not no, they're left over. So they're not muksa because they're not designated anymore for construction, and or they're not muksa for that reason. And they're also not muksa because they're not usable. Because no, if you've got bricks lying around, you'll use them to sit on. Right? You know that happens sometimes, especially people in Manhattan. Right? They go out, they have lunch, they sit on you know on steps or whatever. You have a nice rock, you sit on a rock. So, and presumably that would be a natural use, and therefore they're not muktzah. Now, <coughs> why is it now? So, that, so far, it's not clear what the question is. So, here's the next part of the statement: Sharginahu. If, however, you pile them up and put them all back in a pile, you know, in like a nice stacked pile. Fadai Aktsinu, then you've made the muks again. Because you stack them all up very nice. It means now you're gonna set you're setting them aside to be used in another construction purpose. You know, they're not just there for sitting on and using. So what's the question? So the question is, it's fate funny. You know, the Gemara says, Oh, we're talking about a house that's made with bricks that has no plaster, therefore you can break into it. So my response would be, isn't that at least a direct banan of Sota? The Gemara's question is, but wait, it's still muktzah. Because we, we have this teaching that if you stack up bricks, you make them, you know, even leftover bricks, you've made them up. So before so, you them, you stack them up before, before you them. them. Right. So here, that's stacking them up because you are, are going to use them for something, for some construction. Certainly, if you stack them up to create a type of a shed, that makes them muktza. That makes so them off limits. Yes. So that's the Gemara's question. How can you still break into it? Isn't it still a muktza problem? So Amr Rebbe Zeres, so Rebbe Zeres says, Be Yantav Amru, Avalo B'Shabbos. We're talking about Yantav, not about Shabbos. And therefore, what? So what? Isn't it still Mukta? So the answer seems to be that, again, the same way we've given other areas of latitude on Yantav for the sake of food preparation, and let's not forget that according to the Torah, you're allowed to do malachas on Yantav for food preparation, that we will waive Mukta concerns if it is directly relevant to getting access to food and to getting food. And look at Tosfos. Amr Rebbe Zeres, this tiny toast is at the bottom. He says, Pirish, dihitiru muktza, mishum ochel nefesh. Avalobe Shabbos, mikan yesh raya luitzvash, pirish lael, de tilto mukta hitiru biyomto, mishum ochel nefesh. Right, which is quite fascinating because the more we've sort of been finding things that are like, you know, very local allowances or things that are more like local categories. Cooking is a category that's about food. Muktza seems to be this like, you know, bro very broad based thing. So, and it, so here it becomes a, you know, and to sort of say, well, if it's getting in the way of preparing food, we can waive a muktza concern. Right. How far can you take this? It's a very interesting question. Certainly not to eat the food, right, because this is something that's an obvious obstacle to getting to the food, right? So much of what we talked about before were these muktza issues, right? So if your if your if, if your food is if your food is muktza, that's the first Mishnah. Your food is muktza, the egg. So we're not going to let you. If the food is muktza, we're not going to let you ignore that. But if muktza somehow is an obstacle to you getting to the food, then we're going to. But again, think about all of the earlier Mishnayot, like matchilim beotzar tchila. All these other types of things, which seem to sort of say that muksa concerns remained relevant concerns even in the context of food. And Tosus here is saying that they don't. So how to make all of that work together is not so clear. So yes. First of all, Rashi also so seems to say the same yes, thing. Tosa, yes, Rashi right? says yes. He just okay. Tosus just makes a point of right. it. Yes. And, but it's really interesting the way you conceptualize it. I would have thought the opposite. In other words, if you're you can't put simchat yom tov you more than the food itself. Right. These are like machshire ochel nefesh, right? I have right. to get at the food. Yes, but I was more but talking the about the yeah. It's really interesting the way you say yes, that. Yes, but, but the reason is because if the food itself is off limits, then it's like not food that's supposed to be used for yuntiv. You know, that sort of more disqualifies it. We don't want to, you know, whereas opposed to if the food itself is okay to eat. Everything else is preventing, preventing you. That seems to be the difference. But again, you have to say, how does this work into the discussions of Machilim Ba'utzar, uh, all the earlier discussions? Anyway, here the Gemara seems to say, we we ignore the Muktza concerns to at least Rebbe Mayer does. Maybe that's one answer, that this is Rebbe Mayer. Rebbe Mayer ignores the muksa concerns to and allow you to get access to the food. But so Rashi seems to turn the uh, bricks into rocks. Cedar shell avanim below That's a good point. Okay, so anyway, let's. So now let's go back to the Gemara. 
Tanya Nami Hachi Mitat. Similarly, Rabbi Meir Omer Ach Tochet Lechatchila Vinotel Biyom Tov. Amru La Le Se Amru They said. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, I, I misread that. Al pochet lechatchil ben otel biyom tov amru avolo b'shabbat. So the bright that clearly says that Rabbi Meir's heter is limited to yantov, and yantov we know we allow more for the sake of food, and that's why he's allowing it. And according to the Gemara, what it's doing is it's allowing muktza issues. If you would have asked me, I would have more said it allows soter derabanan, mm -hmm. right? Allows the fact that somehow we'll say it's not biblical soter; it's a temporary, it's not plaster, but that's what's sort of being given a license to. Whereas the Gemara sort of more frames. It in terms of the Muktza. Okay, I'm a Shmuel. Now says Shmuel. Now this is a very important in terms of defining issues of Bona and Soter. So we turn a little bit away from Yom Tov into a more broader discussion. Chotamot Shebekarka, if you have seals on the ground, basically what you have to think about this is um, they had wells, and think about like a manhole cover. Okay, you got a manhole cover to a well. Um, and what do you do to make sure the manhole cover doesn't, uh, you know, walk away? meaning somebody doesn't take it for their collection of manhole covers or it doesn't just accidentally get lost. Yeah. So you have it roped down and ch or chained like they have sort of at the bank, you know, with the pens chained down. You have it chained and connected to the well, um, and that's how you keep the manhole cover connected to the well. So this is what you've got on Shabbos. So, Chotamot uh, Shebekarka, Matir, you can undo it to get access to the well. It's like it's not like you can lift it up, you know, let's assume that it's chained in multiple places, okay, so, or not, or roped in. So you can undo the knot to get access to the well. Um, Ava, now Rashi points out it's not a Kesher Shel Kayama, or else that would be a problem of undoing knots on Shabbos. And of course it's not going to be a Kesher Shel Kayama because yeah. the whole point of it is, that this, it. is to open it. So it's a type of a knot that's used for undoing and doing. So it's not um, it's not a problem of kesha shel kayam of, of kesh of undoing a knot. The other thing it's not a problem of is just is taking apart a structure. Even though this is rope. On why is it not taking it's apart a structure? Like like because like yes, but why is it not taking apart a structure if it's roped on and you're undoing the connection and it's no longer connected? So, so put it back on. well, okay, you're gonna put it back on, and because you know the the the, the more precise way of thinking framing is like. This is how it's meant to be used, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody sort of says, like when I close a door, somehow I've like done bone because I've now like you know added a part of the wall. Oh, but it's not really bone because it was already attached before. I mean, yes, that's true, but to some degree, this is just this is how you it's use the structure. This is how you use the structure. This is how you use the well. Is you open it up by undoing it, so it doesn't really create a structural change, even though physically, for the time being, it's not. Connected. Connected. That's allowed, that you can undo the knot. Okay? Aval, lo mafki avlo chotech. What you cannot do is unravel the rope, um, like, you know, it's one of those braided strings, or, an, or cut the rope. Okay, now you'll say, look, physically you're doing the same thing. Physically you're detaching the co cover from the well. But no, there's a big difference, because now you're doing it, A, in a way that makes it hard to put it back, <laughs> and B, in a way that really, like I said, it's not the way in which it's intended to be used. You have structurally changed it, even though in both cases, the cover is not attached. In the first case, it's not attached, but as, as you know, as you said, David, it's in the process of coming back on, and this is all seen as still combined in the same structure. Here you have really severed their relationship, not just in the physical way, and therefore that is considered soter, a type of deconstructing yeah. of a structure. So mafkia means to take out? No, mafkia means to un unbraid the rope. Unbraid the rope. Yeah. Okay, so that's what he says. Very important here in terms of thinking about issues of soter. Um, now, Shebekalim, if you have something like that in a vessel, you've got like a little, uh, you know, box at home. You've got, I don't know, like a box by your bed, you know, a locker, and it's got this cover of it also that's kept on by ropes. So, Matyo Mafkivachotech, that you can even cut the rope. Why? Because this is the principle of Ein Bone Vesoter Bekalim. The idea, sort of like I talked before, there's a big difference of knocking down a house right, 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 to get right, to the right. food and tearing open a bag of potato chips to get to the food. Okay, so there is a is an issue by structures. So there is not an issue by Kalen. Okay, and therefore it is okay to destroy the vessel. That's like tearing open your potato chip bag, that's okay. But it's not okay when you're dealing with the well and with a structure connected to the ground. Okay, yeah. Echad Shabbos ve'echad Yantav. And this doesn't matter Shabbos or Yantav. Even on Shabbos, you're allowed to, you know, be chotech, and if it's a kli, which again gets to opening your potato chips mm -hmm. in a destructive way on Shabbat. Okay, Meisrei says, let me ask you about this. 
We have a brighter that says the following. Chotamot Shebekarka, again, these like uh, manhole covers on the ground. B'Shabbos um, Matir, on Shabbos you can undo the knot. Aval, again, it's not a permanent knot. Aval lo mufki avalo choteich, but you can't be, you can't, uh, you know, cut cut the rope. So far, so good. B'Yom Tov, Matir mufki avalo choteich. But on Yom Tov, you can even cut the rope. Okay, now how could that be? This is a structure connected to the ground. How are we letting you cut the rope and change it and structurally destroy it or, you know, deconstruct it on Yantiv? So the Gemara says, Hamdan Rebbe Meir, he, this is Rebbe Meir. Damar af poches lechatchila, the hotel that you can break into the house and to get the food. So therefore, you can do soter to get the food. And here too, you can do soter to get the water in the well. And the rabbis argue on it. I say like the rabbis, they don't let you do soter. Now, of course, the problem is, is that we've explained Rebbe Meir that he wasn't real soter, that it was a case of not, you know, unplastered stacked bricks. So therefore, how here are we going to, you know, now that we say that you can really do what seems to be a permanent soter or soter of a permanent structure, we're going to now have to re-understand re Rebbe Meir. Okay, but that's what he is saying. So now the Gemara says, "Umi pligi rabbanon alei bechotamot shebekarka." Do the rabbis really disagree with him? The hatani in this case of manhole covers, we found in the Brisa, "Modim chachamim the Rebbe Meir bechotamot shebekarka." The rabbis agree to Rebbe Meir in the seals on the ground. Shabbos matir avolo mafki avolo chotech. That on Shabbos you can undo the knot, like we said. That's okay. That's its normal use, but you can't cut the rope. Beyom tov matir mafki avochotech. The rabbis will say it's one thing breaking into the structure, <coughs> cutting the cover. That you're allowed to do on Yantav. So now we got two questions. Number one is, why is cutting the cover off different than breaking down the wall? And number two is, why is this allowed on Yantav? Whatever happened to Soter? So we don't have an answer to that yet, but we've got a brighter that says cutting the cover is okay. So how can he say, we say that cutting the cover is not good even on Yantav? So it says, top of Lamed Bet Amalalif, Hu Amar Ki Aitana. He says like the following, Tana de Tani, we Tana Brisa. Chotamot shebekarka. Again, these covers on the ground, on the on the wells. Matir, you can undo the knot. Avolomav kivol chotech. You cannot cut the rope. Echad Shabbos for echad yantav. Whether Shabbos or yantav, either way. So we do have a bright that that says that yantav is the same, and you cannot cut the rope on yantav the same way you can't do it on Shabbat. Bishabakli. Now, if it's a vessel, bishabbos matir avolomav kivol chotech. Now, this is going to be more machmir, though not. In, in the on, you know in the vessel case as well, not just more machmir on the manhole cover on yuntiv. If it's a uh, if it's a vessel, then on Shabbos you can undo the knot, but you can't cut it. Yontov matim afkiyav choteich, and on yuntiv you can even cut the rope. So now the Gemara is going to say that brayta doesn't all work like you. Tirats to lucharesha. The first part of the brayta works like you. It says that when it comes to the manhole cover, that you can't do even on yuntiv. But elasei fakasha, the end of the brayta doesn't work like you. Because the end of the Brighta says that when it comes to a vessel, you said, vessel, fine, destroy the vessel, cut it, I don't care, Shabbos, Yantav, doesn't matter. Open up the bag of potato chips. But this Brighta says that when it comes to, even in the vessel case, on Shabbat, you're not allowed to cut the rope. So the end of the Brighta doesn't work like you. So the Gemara says, no. Hamani Reb Nechemya. The end of the Brighta is Reb Nechemya, and it has nothing to do with the problem of Soter. It's a Reb Nechemya that is a completely different issue, which is why he doesn't want you to cut the rope on Shabbat. What's his different issue? So the Amar, Kol HaKelim Einitlim Elo Derech Tashmishan. So Reb Nechemya is an extreme position in the world of Muktzah. And what Reb Nechemya says is, even a normal vessel, like your knife in the kitchen, which you would say is absolutely not Muktzah, he says even your knife in the kitchen is only allowed to use for what a kitchen knife is usually used for. And oh. you cannot use your kitchen knife to cut the rope on your vessel. You can't use your kitchen knife to scratch an itch. You can't use your kitchen knife to pick your teeth. The only thing you do with a kitchen knife is what it is normally used for is for cutting food, you know, that is being served or whatever. So therefore, he says, look, in principle, you're destroying a vessel like tearing open the bag of potato chips. That's allowed to get to food. That's allowed on Shabbat. Why? And that's what I said. Why does this bright to say that you can't cut the rope on Shabbat? Yeah. Because that's Reb Nechemia, who it's not about the destruction part. It's about using a knife to cut a rope. And a knife is not supposed to be used for cutting ropes. Uh, you know, a knife is supposed to be used for the kitchen knife. Now, maybe you have a knife that's used for cutting ropes, but that might be muktza. Okay? But the knives that aren't muktza aren't set aside for cutting ropes. Okay? He says, Mar says one minute. If it's Reb Nechemia, might you your Shabbat? 
So that issue of not using your knife for some different purpose is not shouldn't be limited to Shabbat. Feel Yantiv Nami. He presumably has a problem even about what you use your vessels for on Yantiv. So, and if you say maybe Reb Nechemia would distinguish, maybe he'd be more more strict on Shabbat about using vessels only for their intended use. Maybe on Yantiv he'd be more lenient. Does he really make a distinction? One Brisa teaches. Now this is clearly yantiv because it talks about mm -hmm. using fuel for fire. So what type of things can you use for fire? What is muktzah and what's not muktzah? So according to one brighter, it's a very interesting thing. You can take a nice whole vessel, you can take, I don't know, a chair, a chair thank you, and throw it in the fire. But if your chair broke you on Yantav, you can't throw it in the fire. Why not? That's the more natural thing, because it broke on Yantav. So since it broke on Yantav, then it became Muktza when, once it broke, even though we say, why did it become Muktza? Why did it turn into firewood? But nevertheless, the chair isn't Muktza, so you have, you have something not Muktza, use it for firewood. But Broken chair, if it broke on Yantav, is Muktzah. Don't use it for firewood. Fitani Idach, so that's a position that holds a Muktzah and distinguishes between the chair and the broken chair. Fitani Idach, we taught another Brisa. Masikin Bain Bekelin Bain Bishiv Bekelin, you can even use the broken chair. Okay, why is that? So that is the position, is presumably, is the position of Rebbe Shimon that doesn't hold a Muktzah. So even if it broke on Yantav, it's not Muktzah, it's not Nolad, it's not a problem. Fine. The uh, Tanya Edoch, and then we have a third price that says, Ema seeking low bekalim, low bekalim. Not only can you not use the broken chair because it's no lot in Mukta, you can't even use the chair. Okay. Now, why can't you use the chair? Umishani, and we answered, low kasha. How Reb Yehuda, the first position is Reb Yehuda, who holds of Muktzah and distinguishes between the chair and the broken chair. How Reb Shim, and the second one that lets you use both is Reb Shim, and he can even use a broken chair, he doesn't hold of Muktzah. How Reb Nechemia, the third one doesn't let you use the chair, is Reb Nechemia. Yeah, now, you can't, chairs aren't firewood, but now we have a problem. This is Yantav, because we're talking about firewood. Mm -hmm. So you see, Reb Nechemia has this issue even by Yantav. So how come you think that the brighter that says, don't cut the rope, that the first part, it's based on Reb Nechemia, isn't uh, Reb uh, but then why does it allow it on Yantav? So the says, trade and I believe it to Reb Nechemia. Fine, there will be a debate whether Reb Nechemia would say his position about not using a vessel for an unintended use. Would he say it on Yantav as well? One approach is he would, one approach is he would not. I want to tell you, though, that we are still left with a big unanswered question, which is, we started by asking, isn't it so there? And then in the end, we sort of said, okay, but according to Abraita, you can actually cut the rope on the cover of the manhole to get access to the water, and we're not concerned with so there and it compared it to the uh, you know to the case of the what do you call it to the um, to the case of breaking into the house and so why is that allowed why isn't that a molachi doraita now there could be answers maybe you could say you know the real doraita is only so terrible not live note the real doraita is when you would like knock down a building because you're going to rebuild something in its place if you're just destroying it to get access to something and not as a process of reconstruction <laughs> that's that's makalkin. Okay, but it is interesting that we're started by completely redefining the case so it would not be a soter issue. Yeah. And then in the end, when it got to the seals and the manhole covers and whatever, it seemed to say, okay, well, according to Rebbe Mayer, you're allowed to do it to get to the food without clearly, you know, clarifying. We could say Mikalko and other explanations, but again, the Gemara did not really clarify, according to that approach, how it had dealt with those issues. clarify the following for me? Uh, on some fundamental level, a water cistern? Yeah.